welcome to Queer Magic. Today we've got Mortellus on the show. Uh, they are a Gardnerian Wiccan, um, author of Do I Have to Wear Black, a mortician, funeral directrix, um, author, witch and necromancer. So uh, they also have a fascinating theory about Santa Claus. So this is a seasonal episode of Queer Magic. So welcome Mortellus. Thank you, and thank you so much for letting me come on and have a ramble about Christmas. Yeah, it's a fascinating I, subject. I always find uh -huh. myself on social media this time of year, and it, it seems like I'll be naughty. It just seems like witches in particular, or the occult community, can be so very self-serious on social media, and particularly at the holidays. It's like, oh, these Christmas trees up, and we're not Christian, and who's that for? And it, it just feels so sad. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I always want to pop in and give a new perspective when I can. That's totally right. cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, th I think everyone should read Ronald Tutton's Stations of the Sun, which basically tells you which bits of Christmas are pagan and which bits are Christian and which bits are both and which bits are secular. So, mm -hmm. And then we can all, like you say, lighten up and enjoy all the things. We're all, as a community, I think, well past the, the whole idea of Christian stealing. The holiday from I mean, we know it's a syncretized holiday and that's yes we can be adults about it I would hope so by now yeah <laughs> right so few people I think celebrate Christmas as a Christian holiday flatly I mean I think it's it's become so secular truly yeah it's interesting I mean I'm seeing a lot of uh, Jewish perspectives popping up and a lot of them are saying you know um they you know because they are kind of outside of that consensus that you know Christ christmas trees are are part of the festival sort of thing that they do feel that they are that the christmas tree is a, is not secular right. um and i can see that but you know i kind of feel it's a it's an amalgam of the pagan greenery that we would always bring into the house <laughs> and the lutherans going this christmas thing's a bit boring isn't it shall we put some greenery on it it's <laughs> funny too because um I grew up with very, very evangelical parents. I, gr I grew up in an, in an evangelical cult, actually, which is, that's a whole part of my backstory, but. High five, as, same. <laughs> as such, I know the Bible very well. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's funny to think of a Christmas tree as Christian when the Bible says, don't put trees in your house or decorate them. Like it's flatly says, this is a pagan thing and not to do it. <laughs> so it's not Christian at all it's pretty clear about bring like don't cut trees down and bring them in and decorate them with silver and gold and and that sort of thing which i think it's it's funny to to imagine communities thinking of it as a christian symbol yeah for sure i mean i suppose that you know it's um it all depends on your perspective like most things very true <laughs> your poor viewers are have to tolerate my tea it's First thing in the morning. I've been up all night doing death care work. It's <laughs> very important. Bags under the eyes, which Zoom is very politely adjusting for me. <laughs> it's amazing. I, I find if you have a Zoom background on, it does your hair as well, which I find super yeah. helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know much about that, though I did try and be festival for or festive for your viewers, put up some decorations. Very pretty. I like it a lot. And I, yeah. I don't know, we can't see it very well. I'll have to adjust, but. This is usually the star on top of my tree. Uh -huh. uh, and each of the five uh, branches is a consecrated wand. Oh, wow. Uh, which is, is something sort of special. But my twin three year old said it was old and dirty and they wanted a twinkling star. So <laughs> we got a, a golden one. <laughs> I, have a, I have a gold star that, that has like a little cavity in the middle it's very slightly bent and then I, I stick a fairy light up the middle of it so it actually that's, shines that's kind of what we wound up with this year <laughs> very cool yeah i have yes. uh, three children actually one is um a grown-up an adult gender fluid and then i have uh, a set of um mab Afeb twins they're three years old born on beltane just like me so <laughs> cool. very magical <laughs> that's awesome Aren't you supposed to have kids born like nine months after building? <laughs> That's very specific. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but still, it's very magical. <laughs> very magical. 
I, I didn't get to know how magical being born on Beltane was until I was an adult and really got into pagan communities and everyone thought that was very cool. <laughs> I never really <laughs> thought of it that way. Yeah, it is very cool. Yeah, I actually know a guy who was born on Samhain um, oh, and my. he went to, um, when he was a kid and he was brought up in something like the JWs or something, I forget what, um, he was a kid and he went to the Witchcraft Museum on the Isle of Man um, at just the right time and he was wandering around the witchcraft museum and his parents had always told him well you know you were born on halloween that makes you a witch and you know so he, he went up to this big cauldron and started stirring it with whatever was to hand and went i'm a witch i'm a witch and this elderly gentleman with a big big shock of white hair came along patted him on the head and said yes you are my boy <laughs> Um, my, the high priestess that trained me, who is now my mother-in-law, by the way, that's fun and complicated. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, was also born on, on that one. So that's cool. cool. That's very cool. I had found a bit of, uh, of lore once and please don't ask me for a source because I will be terrible about it right now, but <laughs> far too, too tired. Um, but I had read once that, uh, being born on Beltane meant that you, your parents weren't your parents, that you were the, the gods Ooh. children. Yeah. And changeling. When I first read that, just I was much younger and much more naive in the craft, of course, but I, I loved it because of the, the abusive background I grew up in and just imagining, oh, well, those people weren't my parents. I, just, I, I found it wholesome. Yeah. <laughs> Very sure. silly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how scary the evangelicalism was, but, um, you know, I, I can, I mean, luckily my parents escaped halfway through my childhood, so managed uh, to survive drowning in a baptismal pool so it was about that level whoa. okay <laughs> yeah that's bad yeah. um yeah and like i've always thought you know being held under by two really burly men in underwater is just like that's terrifying um it may be uh something unfamiliar to your listeners but there's a there's a, a cult called word of faith it's a very particular set of beliefs and that was the the ideology i grew up with um and they're very, very into the idea of anything bad you do is caused by demons or that sort of thing. Oh, shit. They, they have to be cast out. And I was not an ideal child. I was very questioning and curious about everything. Um, so I was not hardly five years old when they decided I, I had the spirit of witchcraft in me. So I, I had it quite bad for a while. So. The, the, I mean, like, way to go like well done but also oh my god that's scary it was very scary um, yeah and um it was at that age that I, we'll have to put a trigger warning i suppose in the notes but uh, it was about that age that I, I had been um sexually assaulted by a minister and that was very damaging and very life-changing and yeah. um, i had attempted suicide at the at the ripe old age of five after wow. that happened and I have to say it with a smile and brightly otherwise it's a horror but yeah. so I think after that the changes in my personality they they perceived as some kind of evil because I couldn't I couldn't forgive or love that person who went on being the minister oh my god <laughs> yeah like like uh the notion that you have to forgive and forget is is just utterly toxic you know i um um i might be able to i yeah i don't think i've forgiven the person that abused me um and i probably never will um and i'm glad that no one's trying to tell me that i should you know and I'm, um and i certainly wouldn't want that person around in my life in any way i think that um <clears throat> paganism let's use that as a term as though it means anything <laughs> yeah a very broad umbrella term yeah yes I, I think that you know we don't have a concept of sin and we don't have a concept of forgiveness and I think that what we're called to is personal responsibility yes we can choose to uh forgive if that's something we want to adopt into our life but we don't have to i think it's up to the people who do wrong to make right what they have done in the world yes absolutely um, that has always been my perspective i think i've always thought actually that totally at left field of this conversation but i've always thought that's why paganism is such a great ideology to as though it's an ideology 
to inject into the prison system. I and mean, we have these ministers that go around doing prison ministry, but they're talking about, you know, getting saved and everything is fine and you're a new person and washed clean and all better. But you know, that's really different from the high priestess like myself who will go in and say, that's not true at all. You fucked up and you have to fix it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's it. an ideology of making right, making yeah. it. And that's not, I mean, it's not even proper Christianity, let's be fair, you know, what they're it's saying is it's like, you know, the, the a more nuanced Christian perspective would be something along the lines of, um, of, you know, you might be, you might be forgiven, but you have to do something to make it right anyway, you know, um, because you can be forgiven on a, in a supernatural way, um, but you still have to, you still have to make things right on earth as much as you can so i think, I, I think um, too, there's that very sort of toxic american christianity that we deal with yeah it's very i said sorry and everything's fine now and i'm going to do the same thing tomorrow <laughs> it's, it's yeah <laughs> yeah well it's i mean i think it's the problem with western christianity because they have this idea that you're making some kind of bargain with god uh, mm. which is incidentally what mercy means it means a bargain um, whereas in Eastern Christianity, um, eleison means to pour olive oil on someone's wounds. Completely different concept. I think too, it, it, we're talking about sort of the term, my goodness, we got off topic, didn't we? Totally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love the idea of mercy as a bargain because in a bargain, there must be a trade, right? Yeah. There has to be something given and received and if you're giving nothing and only taking mercy um, you haven't really completed that bargain yeah that's one way of looking at it yeah i just think it's all the other toxic shit that comes with that like you know the whole sure. um god is an angry old git in the sky who wants to sacrifice who wants to kill everybody so he has to <laughs> sacrifice his own son to himself and all that you know that's just weird um <laughs> but we uh, yeah I think, um, yeah, I can see it, but I, I think, I mean, when you said about the pagan perspective on these things, what I thought, uh, and it being restitution, I kind of, my immediate thought was we're guilt, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is where the Anglo-Saxons and other cultures said, right, okay, you know, you have killed this person, so now you must pay their family um, a big stack of cash. Um, and... Uh, and I think that, I mean, the Brehon laws in Ireland had a similar sort of concept as well. So, um, so that they, although obviously you can't calculate the value of a life in money, at least there was, at least the other family then received compensation for that person. And hopefully it's kind of screwed up the life of the, um, <laughs> presumably like the, the person who did it must have felt some, impact on their life uh, interesting fact that has nothing to do with what we're talking about um being in the death care industry i have to see all kinds of statistics about death all the time mm. and, um there is a calculation for the value of the human life and it was worked out by the airline industries ah that yeah. calculation works out to about three million dollars wow so they weigh things like whether or not um seatbelts are worthwhile because they know that having three point and four point seatbelts in an airplane uh, severely reduces your risk of death in a crash however the cost of putting them in planes outweighs the value of simply paying approximately three million dollars per person that died whoa if you're whoa. interested in those kinds of facts there's a book called stiff um, and it talks a lot about those kinds of statistics. Wow, that is yeah. Because I mean, given the proportion of crashes to to not crashes, um, mm -hmm. they probably that. Oh, that's shocking. It, it is interestingly yeah. and also sort of related as part of all those myriad studies on plane crashes. Um, they had to build models of airplanes because they wanted to understand what happened to the human body if you impacted water in a plane. Mm. So they needed living participants. We can't put humans in a plane and crash it. So they used guinea pigs. Oh. 
but the, I know that's terrible. It's terrible. It really is. But we needed to understand how human beings would be affected. Obviously, I wasn't part of this, so I'm third party. Yeah, I get you. But they needed to understand things like how crash scatter worked. So that required they make tiny luggage with actual objects in it and dress the guinea pigs up in clothing so oh, wow. that we could see if like their shoes flew off and things. So <laughs> imagine what a silly sort of. That is bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Well, having been in the car crash, um, I can totally see that that and and the way that that goes um I can see that that would be important for sure exactly um, because yeah I had a bruise from like just above the top of my tummy all the way to my knees I, I was in a car accident once um driving in a two-seat truck with a third person that shouldn't have been in it sitting on like the bucket in the middle and we someone ran a stop sign and ran in front of us i was the only person injured because my instinct was to turn and catch the person in the middle and i braced against the dash so oh my. my my arm went through my shoulder and i went through the windshield oh my god it was very unpleasant but yes but now i can dislocate my shoulder like a party trick so that's that's fun yeah good hmm. yeah i have a dislocated rib so i am yeah, but other than that, uh, my seatbelt and my airbag saved me. We've um, gotten... <laughs> and my life did flash before my eyes as well. We've gotten so terribly away from like holidays and... We have, <laughs> yes. But, I you know. to do that, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no worries, I think it was an excellent and probably necessary tangent. So, um, yeah, so tell us, so veering back to the the holidays um tell us about your santa theory more tell us oh, well i think our lovely host is going to place some links in the description for you to some blog posts i've written before but um sort of relevant to all these things we're talking about because growing up with parents who were rather cruel and it, we were in a circumstance where i was the oldest of several children and not having those sorts of celebrations in our life and that kind of joy but also being aware of it i think was a huge factor and and i had this experience where i i put some faith in santa claus one year rather than trying to do things for my my younger siblings which led to a lot of heartache and and i do talk about that in, in the post but it it brought me a new perspective as an adult because I think of that Shel Silverstein quote, all the magic I've seen in the world I had to make for myself because I found myself in a position where I could have made magic for others, but chose to put my faith somewhere else. Faith, what a word, right? But I believed rather than doing, and I think that says a lot about magic, is magic about thought, intention, belief, or is it about doing? Is magic active? I really think that it is. What good does it do us to light a candle if we don't also do practical mundane things to try and affect what we're trying to manifest in the world? Yeah. And Christmas can be that really. We have an opportunity to embody something of the spirit of Christmas and be that for others. And I think that's a really powerful gift. I have three children. As a queer person, I eschew gendered language everywhere that I can, but mom is a word I choose for myself because that's what I am to them. And for all you nerds out there, you know, if you've read The Crow, you've heard the expression, mother is God in the eyes of a child. We are so much of the world's magic to them. So I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what do I want Christmas to be for my children? And that evolved over time. Of course, I have an adult child and I now have these young twins. So I got to adjust my ideas as they got big enough. But I think a lot of pagan parents kind of go the opposite direction. They just, they don't participate in it because there's this opportunity for a lie and for hurt. But I like to think of Santa Claus as a deity. 
Santa Claus has had some type of practice or belief or ideology for about 1,750 years, which is far older than any neo-pagan tradition today has been practiced. So talk about an egregore where millions of children put all their belief and hope and faith and worship into this figure. They understand his rituals, writing letters, leaving milk and cookies, being good, um, the spirit of generosity. And I came to believe that it, it could really be an excellent primer for children for pagan practice. There are so many things that it's very hard to teach children, like the idea of embodying a deity, um, libations, drawing down, um, sacred acts on behalf of a deity, those sorts of things. So we made that kind of part of our practice. For example, we consecrate our tree and skirt when we put it up, make it a sacred space. We have a little ritual. We have a drawing down ritual we do where we draw down Santa and we wrap gifts that we purchased in their name and gift to Toys for Tots or, or any charitable organization you like. Um, we do milk and cookies as a libation. We don't leave them out for Santa. We have a little ritual where we, you know, we break the cookie, we take a bite, we leave a bite, and then we leave them out in nature. We just make sure we're not choosing chocolate chips or anything that might hurt the animals. But those sorts of things, I think, add a different layer. Mm. Where rather than saying, well, that, that person at the mall is Santa, we're saying that person is embodying Santa Claus. Yeah, absolutely. Then, it's brilliant. I love if, it. If you speak to them, Santa can hear you because he, the spirit is there. And I love the idea that children go from seekers of gifts to becoming initiated into the mysteries of Santa Claus, getting to be Santa Claus for others, getting to carry that secret for those seekers. We're all accustomed to keeping mysteries sacred, holding those things close to our heart and giving them to people when they're ready. Why not apply it here? Yeah, that's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Um, it's funny actually, because um, growing up, I. Um, we didn't really have Santa because my parents were Plymouth Brethren um, until I was nine and then um, they left. Thank you, parents. Well done. Um, <laughs> and um, and so I, as I mentioned, consciously decided to believe in Father Christmas. Um, and, you know, in my 12 year old brain, um, you know, I was already kind of a proto theologian. And um, so I decided that uh clearly um either there must be multiple centers that that zoom around but anyway i kind of realized that santa was or well, father christmas was a spirit and not um a literal man that comes down the chimney um and so everything you're saying really resonates with me and i you know um i had a scrapbook as a kid and i put i got some really nice wrapping paper that had pictures of father christmas on and i put them in the in the scrapbook and um so that was you know obviously because i didn't know anything about invocation or libations or <laughs> stuff as a 12 year old um but yeah i'm completely resonating with what you're saying um and i think that like it's just it's just too important a concept um to let to let it go and not celebrate it because uh, if you go back to the earlier forms of Father Christmas um, or Yulutontu in uh, in Finland or Yulanissa in Norway, um, okay. they are quite clearly um, derived from pagan um, concepts. Right. So, um, yeah, incidentally, side note, have you seen the wonderful Norway Post um, advert with yes isn't it, isn't it wonderful the I father christmas it. advert we're wearing oh my gosh. it's so wholesome i just I it's adore. just beautiful i just um i cried and aren't they the most handsome people just yeah very right very handsome fellows <laughs> yes <laughs> no i really i love those they're, they're just really precious um That's awesome i was going to say i think you know as, as british traditional witches we're, we're so used to the idea of you know, seekers someone in outer court who doesn't fully understand everything that we know and that applies so cleanly to Santa. It does, yeah. And giving, giving that mystery to a child as they get older and they're ready and explaining it to them in such a way 
you know, this is using language like not saying, you know, this is something that Santa brought you, saying you know, the spirit of Santa led me to buy this for you. You just changing your language makes such a difference. Yeah, I love it because that way, like, um, the child can carry on believing in Santa, but in a more nuanced way. So exactly, you're not just you're not just going right. Sorry, Santa doesn't exist. You you're like Santa does exist, but in a slightly different way than the than the five year old understanding. Santa exists just like the Morrigan exists. Like absolutely, in a, we're doing their work in the world. We're holding them in our heart as we do that work. And, and I like to think of Santa as an egregore that we're tapping into. Something Absolutely. We are, something yeah. we are adding to, but but also pulling from. Yeah. And also, you know, if people object to calling him Santa or Father Christmas or whatever, then um, they can go with Eulanissa or, or something, you know, like. We say the spirit of generosity a lot. Yeah, that works. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's I think it's such an interesting way to 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 help children understand those sorts of concepts. Like, for example, we were talking uh, the other day, the, the kids and my spouse and I about uh, what cookies uh, and beverage we wanted to put out for Santa, what we wanted to use for a libation. And we were talking about, well, when when I do ritual, I choose, you know, something to drink and eat that I know the cup and leader likes because they are embodying the gods so we mm. want them to be honored so since you know your parents are embodying the spirit of santa what what do we enjoy that you might leave for us so we get to sort of talk about those kinds of things in a different way which i think is interesting it's an interesting build up to pagan yeah. practice if, if they choose it for their life yeah i love that and i mean it's interesting i think um, I do think that everything you've just said is a uniquely Wiccan perspective on it is <laughs> um, so it may not you know may, maybe other pagans might see it in a different way but I um, I completely love that uh, you know being a Wiccan myself this is not surprising um, <laughs> I think it's the only time of the year when little bitty kids in my house get to do a drawing down yeah we, we have a little ritual we do around the tree where we we light some incense and we water the tree like we're, we're sprinkling, you know, and um, we have battery operated candles because trees are very flammable, folks. Don't, <laughs> don't yep. candles around your tree. Yeah, like um, it, oh, you see these uh, Victorian pictures of oh, trees so with so candles so stuck to them. I was just like, oh my God, that's such a fire hazard. Like, why, why do they do that? But we'll have something we'll you know we'll pick out some toys in advance and we'll have them in the circle space around the circle space is our tree skirt that's what we, we have oh here. yeah very good and the tree is sort of an altar we wrap our gifts we put them underneath their offerings to the deity um things we purchased for people on their behalf since giving is santa's purview yeah in um, our house i'm afraid the um the gifts are offerings to the cat to knock on the floor <laughs> <laughs> but, but what we do with the kids is sit by the tree and we do our drawing down by connecting with the five senses, which anybody who has anxiety, PTSD, we're all familiar with this, connecting with taste, smell, what you can hear. And it can be a really useful technique when drawing down as well. Mm, for sure. So we, that done, it's very effective. We, we touch the leaves to smell the pine, the needles. Uh, we'll taste a candy cane hanging on the tree. We look at the lights. Um, so we, we connect with, with all of those things. And when they feel the Christmas spirit, we'll play some holiday music and we'll dance around the tree to raise energy and welcome the holiday spirits in. And when they feel the spirit of Santa, they'll put on a Santa hat and we will wrap the gifts and we will go and we'll take them with us to donate them so that they get to be part of all of the actions along the way. So love it. it's a fun tradition. That's very, very cool. I love it. Yeah, one of the things we do actually is um, uh, we do well, we do something. I, I do something very similar to that when giving the, the gifts. Um, so like somebody puts on the Santa hat, so they are Santa bringing the gift to the person they're giving it to. And then that person opens it and and like none of this, everybody goes in for a free for all and opens all their gifts at the same time. It has to be one, like, of one person at a time. Um, and obviously going clockwise. Um, so yeah, um, 
I'm loving your elaboration of all this. It's very good. Um, but yeah, the thing that we do is the Lord of Misrule, which is where um, each person gets takes it in turns to be the Lord of Misrule. Um, and then they can tell everybody else to do something silly. So it could be like gurning or which is, I don't know if, I don't know if North Americans know the term gurning, but it's it's Yorkshire for pulling a face. So oh, like, making a face. Yeah. That kind of thing. <laughs> um, and, um, and you have to pull the silliest face or you have to do like Monty Python's Ministry of Silly Walks um, or tell the most outrageous lie that you can that you can tell, um, which is always a fun one. We do um, think um, like Dirty Santa. Do you do you play that there? No, what's Dirty Santa? <laughs> Dirty Santa's fun. Um, so it's sort of like a Secret Santa thing where you, everybody brings a gift, but you don't draw names and you try and bring something lovely that anyone would enjoy. And when everyone is there, you, you write a series. Of, uh, if you have 10 people, you make 10 slips of paper numbered one through 10. And everyone draws a number and you want to be the person that goes last, but the person, the person who got one opens any one of the gifts from the pile. They can't see any of them, they just choose. Um, the person that has number two can either open one or take that person's gift. Oh. And this goes all the way around. So ah. the person that goes last can choose any gift they oh. like or the last unopened gift, which then goes to that person. So it's, oh. it's really fun. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I can imagine fights breaking out. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a few tussles. <laughs> no, you're not having that. I want it. Or <laughs> <laughs> someone opens a thing and then you know nobody take this from me. I love it. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Or at least the person who made it then knows, hey, that person really liked the thing I made, even if they didn't end up with it. I've seen people wind up with the gift they brought because oh, they well. liked it, so they chose it. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. Yeah, i I think um I think I'm finding that one a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> It's good fun. It really Yeah, works. sure. It sounds like um uh reminds me of a card game called Shithead, which um <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I thought of. <laughs> now, I can't remember the rules of Shithead, but it's it's equally has these sort of twists and turns and like, you know, the the aim is to end up with no cards. Um, but there's there's various rules where you can dump your entire card stack on Oh, God. On, which could be like this big on the next person so that's why it reminded me um i think dirty santa is very fun in a circle environment because if you bring um like if you restrict everyone to ritual goods or magical items you have to really think about something that anyone would enjoy or, or need or want yeah. which leads you i think to spend some time thinking about everyone which is wonderful but it's a fun game that's fun yeah yeah, I like it. Oh, oh I'll, I'll certainly run it past the coven and see what they think. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Um, yes, yeah, just kicking off my anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what kind of surprise it might be. Well, this is true. Yes. Yeah, bags I get number 10. Um, yeah, neat. That's very, very cool. Um, yeah. Wow. All right. Well, shall we go to the uh, the queer magic interview part? Um, cool. I, did, so, I did want to say for your listeners that um, the, the the tree consecration and the drawing down for children. It I did write a full ritual, and they are in uh, one of the in, in the links, right? Which I will put in the in the footer. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, it, it sounds amazing, and you know, I think there's just so many opportunities to um, to make um, to to take the best of these traditions um, and make them pagan if you need to, um, because they're you know, like I I got kind of cheesed off with somebody because um, they they sent me a card telling me to relax and enjoy the holly the holly and the snowmen and the um you know and stop going on about how how christmas was stolen and blah 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 and um and i'm like the bits that you refer to 
are the pagan bits of Britain. <laughs> you get donkeys and baskets of bread. <laughs> yes. Like there's, there's, uh, somebody I know did a um a blog post uh, on their blog they're actually an atheist he's actually an atheist but he he did this um the venn diagram of christmas um like here's all the secular bits like die hard and the royal institute christmas lectures um and here's all the christian bits like carols and all that stuff and then here are the overlaps and then here's all the pagan bits like the holly and the mistletoe and da 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 and anyway, in the Venn diagram of Christmas, guess who's in the middle of the Venn diagram of Christmas that everybody loves, and that it has DNA from all three, uh, all three things. Obviously, Father Christmas <laughs> or Santa Claus, if you must call him that. <laughs> I did. I did want to say before we moved on from Christmas that um, one of my favorite things about Santa. Well, first of all, nothing we've talked about. Please don't think that just because you don't have children, it's not for you. Try these things for yourself and bring some joy into your life and embody that spirit of giving for others. And it's it's such an opportunity to just share in generosity in a magical way. But um, absolutely, I, I love that. I love that Saint Nicholas in particular is the patron saint of prostitutes and thieves and wolves, and is also a necromancer. Very so, cool. I, there's a fun story about Saint Nicholas raising three children from the dead, which is oh, which yeah. is fun. It's a patron saint of children, so if you work with saints as a synchronization in your magic, you know, doing death magic around children or healing or the, those sorts of things for kids, Saint Nicholas is a great one to call on. And we just we don't think of it, I think, because it's it's a holiday thing, but but yeah. it's there. Yeah, it's very cool. St. Nicholas, very pro sex workers as well. Um, that's where we get uh, hanging Christmas stockings from, leaving bags of gold. St. Nicholas would do that for uh, young girls who didn't have dowries. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. To protect them from going into sex work. Yeah. Um, so he came to be known as a protector of sex workers. Cool. Yeah. I'm down for that. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, you know, um, just because you know just because he was christian I mean, you know, um doesn't mean there's not stuff worth looking at and investigating and enjoying and learning about so for sure absolutely like i'm very keen on the italian um christmas witch befana as well yes like i i have a small witch that i hang on my christmas tree um and she represents befana to me here in uh, the Appalachian South of the United States, we have uh, sort of a Christmas and New Year's grandmother. Um, it's sort of ah. this, a mythical sort of creature um, that sneaks into homes. And um, depending on the story you're hearing, they might clean up for you. They're welcome to wash my dishes anytime um, or leave a gift or mend things. Um, so we have the, the New Year's grandma is always, that's a fun one. Very cool, yeah. Um, Sounds like the fauna very much. Quite so. a lot, yes. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, and I like all the the you know, I think this all ties in with the um the mysterious stranger of Hogmanay as well that brings the first footing gifts. I think there's something something there too. Um yeah, this is I think that's wonderful. And I really, you know, I really think that um, you know we should all kind of lighten up a bit and and just enjoy stuff you know um there's a lovely quote i like about christmas which is um uh by somebody called earl w count and he talks about how you know generation upon generation of people have woven new ideas and creativity into the mix and made something beautiful that can be passed on through the generations and i think that's that that says it all for me. I brought this book to show everyone because I'm very fond of it, but it's called The Indisputable Existence of Santa Claus, The Mathematics of Christmas. <laughs> it's such a fun book, but it's also really practical um, because it talks about things like how to um, decorate a Christmas tree to mathematical perfection or how much wrapping paper you need for a gift or 
um, how to best calculate uh, Secret Santa drawings so that oh. no one is likely to draw their own name, those sorts of things. That's so clever. But it's very fun. I, I really yeah, like it. I like that a lot. Yeah, um, that's really cool. Yeah, like I really like the thing that Google do where they have they have um, Santa flying across Google Maps. <laughs> That is very cute. Uh, um, NORAD does that as well. They'll put Santa Claus on the weather maps. Very cool. I like it. Yeah, it's cool. Awesome. <laughs>